Hey everyone, this is the first video on solution equilibria. The dissolution of ionic compounds is a reversible reaction between a solid that is yet to dissolve and its dissolved aqueous ions. This equation shows an example on how you can use chemical equations to represent the dissolution of an ionic compound. Barium carbonate, which is an ionic compound, exists in a solid form, but when it is dissolved in water, it can dissociate to produce two ions, barium ion and carbonate ion, both of which will be in an aqueous state. This reaction is a reversible one. Therefore, when a solid is dissolved, it will always reach a state of dynamic equilibrium. And just to remind you, a dynamic equilibrium is a state of the reaction whereby the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate. At a dynamic equilibrium, microscopic changes still occur, meaning the reactions will still occur back and forth, that is, dissolved ions will still react to reform the solid, and the rate at which this occurs is equal to the rate at which the solid is dissolving to produce the ions. Dissolution of ionic compounds can be precisely broken into three different stages or processes. These are separating water molecules, separating ionic compounds into its respective ions, and hydration ions. We'll discuss each of the three stages in more detail. As I'm going through the three processes, focus on describing the processes involved in the dissolution of ionic compounds, and understand how the change in enthalpy and entropy is different and how they are concerned in each of the three stages. The solution of ionic compounds begins with the separation of water molecules. In the diagram on the right hand side, water molecules are attracted to one another by a strong hydrogen bonds. Therefore, hydrogen bonds need to be broken if these water molecules are to be separated. In addition to hydrogen bonds, water molecules are also attracted to one another by dipole-dipole interactions and dispersion forces. However, Hydrogen bonds are usually the main type of intermolecular force discussed in this process because it is the strongest out of the three. It is important to recognize that covalent bonds are not involved in the separation of water molecules, as breaking covalent bonds would instead result in a hydrolysis reaction where the water molecule itself is broken. So remember this, only intermolecular forces are involved in the separation of water molecules. In order to overcome intermolecular forces, a certain amount of energy is required. This is why this process is endothermic, or has a positive enthalpy change. At the same time, the entropy of the system also increases as water molecules are able to move around more freely when they are separated from each other. The second process involved in the dissolution of an ionic compound is dissociation. Dissociation refers to the separation of an ionic compound into its ions. This involves overcoming the compound's lattice energy. Lattice energy simply refers to the energy that holds an ionic compound together into its lattice structure. This is dependent on the strength of its ionic bonds, which is in turn affected by mainly the ionic radius and the charge. Small ions will give rise to stronger bonds and therefore higher energy. Vice versa, larger ions will give rise to weaker bonds and lower energy. In terms of charge, ions with greater charge, for example magnesium and oxide ions compared to sodium and fluor ions, will also give you stronger ionic bonds and therefore greater lattice energy. The most important concept you need to understand in this slide is that ionic compounds, due to the factors we just outlined, have different lattice energies. For example, sodium fluoride and magnesium oxide have different lattice energies because they have different ionic radii and ionic charges. Similar to the first stage, breaking ionic compounds during dissociation is also endothermic, as it requires energy inputs. And since ionic compounds have different lattice energies, they require different amounts of energy. The entropy of the system further increases during this process as the ions are also able to move around more freely compared to when they are organized in a lattice structure. The last process involving dissolution of ionic compounds is hydration of ions. This occurs after water molecules are separated 
and ions dissociated. In this process, free cations and anions are surrounded by water molecules, as you can see on the right hand side in the diagram. Precisely, cations such as sodium are closely surrounded by partially negative oxygen atoms of water molecules, while anions like chloride are closely surrounded by partially positive hydrogen atoms. The process of hydration is driven by the formation of ion dipole forces between ions and water molecules. This attractive interaction is what allows water molecules to closely surround free ions. Since ions differ in the radius and charge, the nature of ion dipole forces they form with water is always different. For example, a larger ion tends to form ion dipole interactions with more water molecules simply due to its larger size. In terms of enthalpy and entropy changes, hydration is opposite to the first two processes. The formation of ion dipole forces releases energy and therefore the process is exothermic. The organization of ions and water molecules into such a specific arrangement decreases the freedom of particles and molecules and thus reduces the entropy of the system and also the disorderedness of the system. The overall enthalpy change of an ionic compound's dissolution depends on the relative magnitude of enthalpy change of each of the three stages of dissolution. Before we discuss this in further detail, let's remind ourselves that separation of water molecules and dissociation are both endothermic because they involve breaking intermolecular forces and ionic bonds respectively. In the third step, hydration, it is exothermic because it involves the formation of ion dipole forces. Overall enthalpy change of dissolution can be better understood using energy diagrams where the vertical axis represents the energy of the system. In the first step, energy increases as it is absorbed during the separation of water molecules. In the second step, energy is further increased as it is absorbed during dissociation. This is followed by an intermediate step during dissolution whereby both the solvent molecules and solutes are freely dispersed, ready for the final process that is hydration. In hydration, the formation of ion dipole forces releases energy, so the system's energy decreases. If the energy released in this step is less than the total energy absorbed during the first two steps, then the system ends up having more energy at the end compared to the start. As a result, the dissolution is endothermic. Let's use the energy diagram again to analyze what happens if the dissolution is exothermic. Again, the energy of the system increases during the first two stages. However, this time, more energy is released during hydration than the total energy absorbed. This causes the energy in the system to be lower at the end of dissolution compared to the beginning. What I hope you recognize so far is that dissolution of an ionic compound can either be endothermic or exothermic. It ultimately depends on how much energy is absorbed and released in each of the three processes. Like enthalpy, the overall change in entropy also depends on the relative magnitude of entropy change of each process during dissolution. Remember that entropy increases in the first two steps while it decreases during hydration, a third step. If the decrease in entropy during hydration is less than the magnitude of increase during the first two steps, then the overall entropy change is increased, therefore positive. Vice versa, if the decrease in entropy during hydration is more than the magnitude of increase during the first two steps, then the overall entropy decreases and thus it is negative.